Welcome everyone. Au nom de la groupe de droit public, bienvenue à la Faculté de droit et à l'Université d'Ottawa. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, the Charter Pitch. I'm Professor Adam Dodik of the Faculty of Law here at the University of Ottawa. I want to acknowledge first that we're here on unceded Algonquin territory, and this acknowledgement is particularly important in a law school and as part of our conference that not only celebrates the 150th anniversary of our Constitution, but will ask critical questions about it. We will be fortunate to have the participation of two Algonquin elders tomorrow and on Friday at the conference at the Shaw Center. Cette conférence est un projet de constitution 150, un partenariat entre l'Université d'Ottawa, la Faculté de droit de l'Université de Montréal, la Faculté de droit de l'Université d'Alberta, et le Centre des études constitutionnelles à Edmonton. I also want to acknowledge that today is International Women's Day, and we are very fortunate to have with us three absolutely outstanding women, um, joined by two decent guys on tonight's, <laughs> <laughs> tonight's panel. Et aussi, je voudrais remercier le, le travail de notre équipe ici à la Faculté de droit, Sylvie Corbin, Derek Bryan et Véronique Larose, for all of their organization and preparation, both for this evening's event as well as for the conference. It's my pleasure now to introduce the host and moderator for the Charter Pitch, Catherine Clark. Ms. Clark is the perfect person to host this evening's event because she has really spent her entire career involved working with people who are involved in some way with politics, government, and our Constitution. Catherine is a nationally respected broadcaster, public speaker, MC, and writer. She's the founding host of Beyond Politics on CPAC, where she has interviewed some of Canada's most influential people to reveal the personal human side of public life. And in that capacity, she has interviewed each current Supreme Court justice for Beyond Politics, and her work was used by CPAC for a special program called Inside the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. There's a lot of constitutional and legal junkies here tonight, so I can <laughs> recommend that you go to, the, uh, go to the website of CPAC and view that documentary on your own time. She's produced programs for CTV Canada AM and appears as a panelist on Direct with Sandy Ronaldo on CTV News Channel, and she's hosted her own talk show with Rogers TV. She's an incredibly prolific professional, and in addition to her television work, she's written for The Globe, The Ottawa Citizen, The Toronto Star, Canadian Living and Forces magazine. What I found perhaps most interesting is that she's the giving back columnist for Ottawa at Home magazine, where she profiles people who are improving the lives of their fellow citizens. In 2016, she was named by the Ottawa Chamber of Commerce as one of Ottawa's 40 under, top 40 under 40 in 2016, which makes those of us who are a little bit over 40 wonder what exactly we've been doing with our lives. <laughs> Mesdames et Messieurs, nous sommes très chanceux d'avoir Madame Clark avec nous ce soir. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Professeur Dodec. C'est vraiment un, un plaisir d'être parmi vous, parmi vous tous ce soir. Uh, merci de m'avoir accueilli. Um, so, no, I'm not a lawyer, although I feel like I'm uh, amongst my peeps here. If you might actually like to watch interviews with Supreme Court justices and documentaries on the Supreme Court. Um, I am the daughter of a lawyer. And uh, on International Women's Day, I should mention that uh, my mother is, in fact, a graduate of this school, this law school. Uh, it was a little while ago, and she made it clear to me that she was one of 21 women in a class of 120. So I think that things have changed a little bit since that time. But I was also noting to, um, to Katie that um, in terms of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, that for our moms and, and some of us for our grandmas, that um, this was a really substantive part of their own history. And my mom was one of a group of, of uh, Canadian women who rallied to ensure that Section 15 was included in the Charter. And so, uh, so I'm really, truly delighted to be here with all of you. So I wasn't exactly sure what Adam was talking about when he said it's a charter pitch. Um, I was made aware that his son Ben uh, pl has 
played for the um, Israeli uh, baseball team. I thought maybe, given that my father is obsessed with baseball, that I was being roped into more baseball. But um, no, he explained that it was a Dragon's Den style event here tonight. So I was intrigued. Um, the contestants are going to be pitching, as you know, their favorite charter case. It's a pretty awesome idea, frankly, for talking about the charter and uh, for gathering people to chat about legal decisions. So uh, Kevin O'Leary will not be here tonight. Um, his private jet broke down. <laughs> but we do have uh, four fabulous contestants who are here tonight who actually live in Canada. Let's note that as well. <laughs> and um, let me explain a little bit about the rules. Maybe Kevin O'Leary needs to know a little bit about the rules too, but he's not here. So each contestant has chosen one charter case to present this evening. Each one will have up to six minutes to make their case to you. And at that point, um, uh, well here, let me give a bit more background. So they want to convince you that their case is the most important charter case. And they have great latitude in doing that in terms of defining the importance of the case, because after all, they are lawyers. But unlike the judges of the Supreme Court of Canada, they don't have unlimited, unlimited time. We're only giving them about six minutes. So um, it's going to be the Coles notes. And after all four of our legal lions, which is the non-copyright protected way that we can refer to them tonight so that we are not infringing, uh, all four of our legal lions uh, will make their pitches and then you, the audience, get to be the judges. You're going to be able to vote on the winner on your phone, on your tablet, on your computers. We're going to be using the program Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T, Kahoot. So feel free to take out your phone and tweet or text away. This is totally fine, um, although since we are in a university and I have children and I know that they know more about technology than I do despite the fact that they're 10 and 7, uh, I think you are all already using your technology. It's not like when I went to university. So I'll explain more about the voting um, after, the, after each of the pitches. And now let me turn to our very patient contestants. We're privileged to have with us today four leaders of the bar in Ottawa. I'll give a fuller introduction to each of them when their own pitch comes up, but our first um, legal lion, not in order of presentation, is Lawrence Greenspan. Lawrence is one of Ottawa's most well-known lawyers and volunteers. His commitment to his clients is matched only by his commitment to charitable causes, including his alma mater, this law school. Those who are familiar with Lawrence know that he likes to be known as a champion of the little guy against big, bad government. And Lawrence has always got something interesting to say. Our second contestant works for that same government, although she and others would say she works for justice. Katie Kaufman is counsel with the Human Rights Section at Canada's Department of Justice. According to her LinkedIn profile, Katie is an intuitive and creative professional trained in law with a passion for interdisciplinary approaches to problem solving, policy, and research. So, um, like everyone else here, not your average lawyer. And our next contestant, <laughs> I guess you kind of are contestants, uh, <laughs> is Anne London Weinstein. Um, first, may I note, and I think Anne deserves a little bit of a, a round of applause here, she became a grandma for the second time this morning at about 9 a.m., and she's still here. <laughs> So congratulations. She is uh, a criminal defense lawyer and currently the president of the Defense Council of Ottawa. Recently, she spent time competing with Lawrence for media time and prodding the government for which Katie works to take such radical action as appointing judges and um, to invest in the justice system. And finally, we have Eugene Meehan. Eugene is the principal of Supreme Court Advocacy, LLP. He is a former executive legal officer to the Chief Justice of Canada, and his practice consists largely of Supreme Court work. Eugene is a man equally at home <laughs> in leather, biking pants, a kilt, and court attire. And I, for one, am sincerely hoping that <laughs> that's part of the, tonight's event. Got my fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. It's very, very nice shoes. Um, so please, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in giving a large legal and non-legal welcome to our four contestants who are gathered here this evening. So we're going to get to the charter pitch, and this is where I get to give you a more fulsome uh, 
introduction to our guests. The first up is Anne, Anne London Weinstein. She graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School in 1995 and was called to the bar in Ontario in 1998. Before going to law school, Anne was a journalist for the London Free Press. The author Joan Barfoot was Anne's favorite editor there, and she remains one of Anne's favorite authors today. Anne worked as an assistant crown attorney in Scarborough before going over to the defense side. This makes me think of Star Wars, the defense <laughs> side. She's a certified specialist in criminal law. She's also the managing partner of Weinstein Law, where she practices with her husband, which she describes as insanity, but it works for us. That's in quotations. And to top it all off, her son is articling for the firm. It's clearly in the genes, Anne. Anne is a former director of the Criminal Lawyers Association and was the first woman from Ottawa to serve as a director of that organization. She currently serves, as I mentioned earlier, as president of the Defense Council Association of Ottawa and can be heard frequently on the radio because the Supreme Court of Canada and the federal and provincial governments are keeping her pretty busy these days. She says she never sleeps. She's passionate about criminal law and a great supporter of young lawyers who wish to enter the profession. She says she's most proud of the work that she's done encouraging young women in the practice of criminal law, which I think is worth mentioning, particularly on International Women's Day. She's a great supporter of this law school. She teaches evidence and trial advocacy and supervises the Innocence Project here on a pro bono basis. She's also a lifelong horsewoman. She started riding when she was five years old, and she showed a colt she bred last year at the Royal, which won seventh out of 17 horses. So clearly you're in it to win, well done. She can also, and this is quite critical to the introduction, she can also drive a tractor. And a standard car, no less. That is a dying skill in these days. Actually having to drive a car at all is a dying skill. Um, so driving a tractor in a standard car is a skill that uh, she holds above most lawyers. She, uh, she also has a restricted firearms license, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Annie, get your gun. All right. And uh, she admits she has way too many horses, two dogs, and a cat. We will hope that she does not use her restricted firearms license to take care of that problem. So um, please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Anne Weinstein. Thank you, Catherine. Well, I am just thrilled to be here today. And how did they get information that I was driving a tractor and that I can drive a standard and that I have too many horses? It's because Professor Dodick said that my original bio outlining my legal accomplishments was boring and nobody wanted to hear about that and was there anything interesting about me and driving a tractor was about the only thing that I could come up that you know had the remotest of interest to uh, to you all beyond what I do in terms of the law. Today I want to talk to you about a case called Stinchcomb. It's a 1991 decision of our Supreme Court of Canada and this case highlights the importance of Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is the right to make full answer and defense. Now, the reason that I, that case is so near and dear to my heart is because that case revolutionized the practice of criminal law in Canada, and that case stands for the protection against wrongful convictions and really revolutionized the way that uh, the Crown is required to provide disclosure to an accused person in a criminal case. Prior to Stinchcomb being decided, disclosure was given sometimes, but there was no absolute rule that required the Crown to provide the case that they had against a person uh, before they went to trial. And so what would happen is trial by ambush was a perfectly acceptable uh, form of advocacy by the Crown. They were not required to let you know the case that you had to meet. And in every wrongful conviction in Canada where there has been an inquiry, including uh, Marshall, Morin, Milgard, Driscoll, Sofino, there has been the withholding of disclosure. And, and most of those cases are post, uh, Marshall is pre-Stinchcomb, most of those cases are after Stinchcomb. But Stinchcomb gave us the legal standing to require that we are provided with the complete disclosure that the Crown has in order to be able to have our fair trial rights respected. And Section 7 really infused the existing common law at the time, including um, the research that had been done by the Law Reform Commission of Canada, talking about the importance of disclosure in ensuring that trials are fair, 
And that language was adopted in Stinchcomb in arriving at the rule that we have today. Now, I can't tell you because Stinchcomb, by the time I was called to the bar, Stinchcomb was well in play. But I know that lawyers who've practiced for longer than I have say that the practice of criminal law at that time was crazy. You might get a chance to look at a police officer's notebook if you were really nice to the police officer and ingratiated yourself, and then you would have some idea of the case that your client would be facing. But that was all. But but prior to Stinchcomb, that's all you had. And Stinchcomb really revolutionized the law in this area. It is a safeguard against wrongful convictions, which I know Professor Binman is going to vote for me on that point for sure. <laughs> right? It's it's a safeguard against wrongful convictions. And in terms of criminal law, it's and you know inside of this heart beats the heart of a criminal defense lawyer. It is the most important case in my view. Um, arguably, Oaks is a very important case as well, but in terms of protection of, uh, against wrongful convictions, the presumption of innocence, the right to make full answer in defense, Section 7 really took the common law and the existing research that existed and just, like lightning in a bottle, revolutionized the law. So I think that Stinchcomb is the case that you have to vote for. If you're concerned about wrongful convictions, you're all here at this law school. I know that you all care about that, so vote for Stinchcomb. Thank you. Well done, Ann, and thank you for that convincing argument. Our next contestant is Eugene Meehan. Eugene is one of the most accomplished and one of the least boring lawyers that you will ever meet, as evidenced by my earlier uh, reference to leather biker shorts and by the mention from the audience about his pretty awesome boots. Are they Doc Martens? Yes, you must show them, please, Sarah. See, look at that. That is a nice boot on a man. Huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me there, John Fluvog. I would not want to be accused, uh, sued for a fashion faux pas. My apologies. Um, he is the founding partner, when he isn't shopping for awesome shoes, of Supreme Advocacy LLP in Ottawa, where Eugene's work focuses primarily on the Supreme Court of Canada, arguing appeals and assisting other lawyers in taking cases both leave to appeal and appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. He also provides complex legal opinions to lawyers and to clients. Eugene holds four degrees in law, but only four. They are from the University of Edinburgh, the University of Ottawa, and two degrees from McGill University. He's also a practicing member of six bars, Ontario, Alberta, Northwest Territories, Yukon, Nunavut, and Saskatchewan. He's also licensed to practice law in the state of Arizona and a member of the Bar of the Supreme Court of the United States. I think you need to work a little harder. <laughs> Professor uh, Dodek was uh, making nice comments about me under 40, but I feel distinctly, uh, as I think we all do, uh, that we need to get on with more things in our lives. So on that point, I have to admit, I also wonder why you're here and not in Arizona in March. But I... <laughs> okay, because, well, that's great. Um, Eugene Meehan was a member of this faculty from 1986 to 1990 before he came to his senses or before he was rescued, your pick, by uh, Chief Justice Antonio Lemaire. From 1990 to 92, he served as Executive Legal Officer at the Supreme Court of Canada, where he acted as the Principal Advisor to Chief Justice Lemaire. He was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1999 and served as the National President of the Canadian Bar Association from 1999 to 2000. He is the author or co author of eight books, and his Supreme Court newsletter is anxiously awaited and read by thousands of eager Supreme Court watchers. He provides legal services to clients and members of the legal profession in French, English, and Scottish, and I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, to, to bring things down to earth, uh, I also have a valid tractor-trailer truck license, <laughs> just so as you know that my, my feet are on the ground. Uh, Carter, Supreme Court, uh, physician-assisted death. Death is the one thing we all have in common, birth, death, and in-between. The in-between part is where all of us are now. Death is literally so universal that artists have done paintings and, and sculptures about death, that memorialize, memorialize death, military, individual, secular, religious. My best friend Dominic, at age eight, 
died. And I was at his bedside that evening with his parents and my parents for prayers. The same bed on which he and I had played Monopoly that morning. I was eight. The phrase I then developed to help me cope um, was that death is the context in which we live. And last year I helped and held a friend and neighbor, just last year, a friend called Ted die. Ted was a World War II Canadian vet um, who had seen ships torpedoed in the North Atlantic in winter. Not many survived that. And those that did, the convoy would not, could not stop to pick any up. Death was not new to Ted in World War II and not new to him in his last hours. It became not new to me as I held his hand worked with him, worked with the medical personnel to communicate and confirm what his wishes were, what his medical directives were, because Ted, quote, wanted to go. To speak plainly, to go without medical active supervision from an affirmative perspective, but he wanted to go. It's definitely not medically assisted death. And to speak very personally, I was afraid, scared indeed, of death. Because of Dominic, Ted took all that away. The gift he gave me, reciprocated by the care I gave him, took all that away. So Ted died, as one oft hears, peacefully, comfortably, as I held his hand. Death is a context in which we live. I want to go. Now, three questions. Do we all die? Yes. Uh, when do we die? Don't know. How do we die? Well, the Supreme Court of Canada has told us some of that. Four brief points from the Supreme Court of Canada, charter case and physician-assisted death. Number one, Rodriguez, September 30th, 1993. The criminal code provision making it criminal for a physician to assist someone uh, committing suicide is constitutionally valid. Chief Justice McLaughlin dissented, as did the then Chief Justice Lemaire. Number two, Carter, February 6, 2015. In other words, 21 years later, the criminal code breaches Section 7, life, liberty, and security of the person, not saved by Section 1. And the test in summary is consenting, competent, adult, enduring grievous, irremedial, and intolerable suffering. The Chief Justice McLaughlin, previously dissented, is now in majority, a 9-0 majority, with reasons written by the court. Quebec has a number three. Quebec has a different test. It's a little long, but it talks about maladie grave et incurable avec déclin avancé et irréversible, des souffrances physiques ou psychiques constantes et insupportables qui ne peuvent être apaisées dans les conditions qu'elle juge intolérables. In other words, a subjective element, the patient. Number four, future implications. Well, there are four. First, will Quebec and the rest of Canada continue to go in different ways? Second, how far and or how far backwards, depending on one's point of view, will these tests be interpreted by those for and by those against? Third, will physician-assisted death ever be available for those with mental illness? And there are many different types of mental illness, organic, uh, acquired brain injury, traumatic brain injury. And last, what effect will these procedures have on the future of health care, palliative care, social values as we all age? as you age? These are questions that fall to every one of you, not just me, not just members of the legal profession, to address. So in conclusion, the Carter decision is like a painting. I refer to paintings at the beginning. Because it sets out why we have a charter. It sets out what the charter is. It sets out how the charter works. It gives us, if you want, a Lego building uh, block of who, what the Canadian society is and what we are within that society. And if Carter were indeed a, pa uh, a painting, it may be the Mona Lisa. But does that make Carter itself a perfect decision? Well, is the Mona Lisa itself a perfect painting? Why did Leonardo da Vinci give the Mona Lisa that quizzical smirk that she clearly has. And is that smirk translated into the decision of the Supreme Court in Carter by way of acknowledging that its own decision, the Carter decision, will be interpreted, reinterpreted, 
perhaps refreshed, perhaps revised by generations over time. And that includes you. That includes all of you. The bottom line is, it ain't over till it's over. And it ain't over. Qui vivra verra. He or she who lives shall see. May each of you be there to live that, to see that too. Um, I hesitate to say vote for death. Um, <laughs> it's like say asking turkeys to vote for Thanksgiving Day. But vote for the principles and the importance of this case because it affects every single one of us, every single one of you. Merci beaucoup tout le monde et bonsoir à tous. Thank you very much, Eugene Mann. Now, I'm legally bound not to have an opinion, but I think the, um, the interesting point about um, Carter, and I use this simply as a reference point as a layperson, um, and for those of you studying the law, is that every, most of us go around living our lives without necessarily acknowledging the laws that govern our lives in, in a civil society, in a democratic society. But um, sometimes a case leaps out where it forces it, uh, the public to really think about laws and their impact on our lives. And Carter was really very much one of those, um, those cases where lay people saw how a law can have a direct impact. So um, interesting to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you. So we're now going to turn to, uh, after death, we're now turning to Katie Kaufman. <laughs> so no, uh, no trouble there, Katie. Katie is a native of Montreal and a graduate of Mount Allison, McGill Law, and the London School of Economics. Katie is a member of the Bar of Ontario and has been working as counsel in the Department of Justice, Justice since 2011. Before moving to Ottawa, Katie articled in litigation and prosecutions with Justice Canada's regional uh, Ontario office in Toronto. She works in the Department of Justice's Human Rights Law section and advises on domestic human rights law issues related to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. She also works in a litigation capacity and drafts pleadings to respond to individual communications filed with the UN Committee Against Torture and the UN Human Rights Committee. Before joining the Human Rights Law section in 2015, Katie worked as legal counsel to the Correctional Service of Canada. There she advised on a wide variety of issues including freedom of religion within penitentiaries, habeas corpus, and the international transfer of offenders. Katie is inspired by the likes of Amy Schumer, because really, which of us isn't? Uh, she likes to bring laughter to the workplace, just like Amy Schumer. She is a, a firm believer in the power of office snacks, again, which of us isn't, tomfoolery, and to-do lists, which I think is very appropriate for a lawyer. She is also a champion of cupcakes and yoga, though not necessarily at the same time. Katie's previous performance credits include Sebastian the Crab in her elementary school's production of The Little Mermaid. Katie, over to you. Thank you, Catherine, for that very interesting introduction. <laughs> and now I turn to my pleadings in poetry on R. V. Noor. While working for the public service as a lawyer, I got nervous. When clients asked me for advice on Section 12, I rolled the dice. When a sentence seemed horrific, cruel, unusual, to be specific, minimum penalty, 20 years, I used to shed a lot of tears, but now I consult the case of Noor. Confusion, it is sure to cure. For those still citing R.V. Smith, claiming no change in the pith, I stand here to convince you Noor changed a lot and much is new. Though one could claim, if one were lame, the framework is much of the same. And I admit, though I digress, Nur kept the first part of the test. In other words, the SEC to analyze an MMP when there's a claim of Section 12, the court confirmed that we should delve into the current situation without any trepidation of the offender before the court. 
So that part hasn't changed, in short. But what about the test part two? That part is wham bam spanking new. Less talk of hypothetical, too complex, too theoretical. The simple truth is not uncouth. No help required from a sleuth. Focus on foreseeability. Keep judges flexibility, which greatly expands from past times the scope of legal inquiry. In fact, the SCC supported use of case law since reported to aid in their determinations of potential situations. What circumstances may arise? Can harmless action, let's surmise, get caught by wording of the crime? Because it could be you next time. To put the thing another way, think generally, but do not stray. Remote or far-fetched is too much. Unlikely, that's okay. Oh, and before I forget, to make my opponents really sweat, the court in Noor, it did declare, with conviction and with flair, that the hybridity of an offense is not considered a defense to claims of charter violation. We are not that kind of nation. Instead, most judges of the court cut the attorneys general short said the court's majority with oh-so-strong finality, <clears throat> the simple possibility of proceeding summarily, prosecutor flexibility, that safeguard is illusory, a sentence is inherently a judge responsibility. <clears throat> so that was at the SEC. But what about reality? Well, for those of us, like many judges, who own a cottage, don't begrudge us. We may, through no fault of our own, leave our restricted gun at home. <laughs> and then make this simple blunder, without intent to loot or plunder, leave our license oh so lawful at our cottage. Not so awful? Well, if this person had been you, you need a lawyer, one, or two, indictment before RV Noor, three years in the clink, for sure. And I know, those of us, the kind among us, focusing on social justice, maybe thinking right on cue. For the poor, what did this do? Did this decision help the poor? It's hard to really know for sure. In the future, we shall see. But for now, in summary, Noor may not be the best known case, may not be the favorite in this race, but in the true spirit of the charter, don't vote for Stinch, Comb, Dismantle, or Carter. Instead, focus on the little guy. Show the underdog your her ally. Noor kept the test. But change the rest. And in this contest, that means Noor's best. Thank you. Oh. Wow, Katie, Sebastian, the crowd was really just the beginning. <laughs> That's remarkable. I think. If someone was taping that, you just went viral. So, um, I also think you have to really love a case to make a five minute poem and memorize it. How, can I ask how long that took? Are you willing to divulge or? Um, I would be willing to divulge. I really don't remember. I wrote this a year ago. Um. Oh, very good. Very excellent, wonderful, and well done. <laughs> Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce poetry of a different kind, let me introduce Lawrence Greenspawn. Lawrence is not only a leader of the bar in Ottawa, he is a committed community leader. He's a graduate of this law faculty and a member of the Common Law Honors Society. He practices criminal defense and personal injury litigation and, in fact, is the only lawyer in Ottawa who is a specialist certified by the Law Society in both criminal and civil litigation. He represents the little guy against governments, institutions, insurance companies, and corporations. 
He um, is a criminal defense lawyer, and he has represented people charged with murder, drug, and other criminal offenses, and represented the first person charged in Canada under the Anti-Terrorism Act. He's a past president of the Defense Council Association of Ottawa. He has done these cases at trial level, the Ontario Court of Appeal, and has appeared at the Supreme Court of Canada on almost a dozen occasions. In 1981, International Year of the Disabled Person, Lawrence co-founded REACH, the Resource Education Advocacy Centre for the Handicapped, and was a chair um, and board member of the organization for over 10 years. He's also chaired the United Way Community Services Cabinet, CAFO, Child and Youth Friendly Ottawa, the Multicultural Centre, the Jewish Community Centre, Motorcycle Ride for Dad, and the Prostate Cancer Fight Foundation. In 2011, Lawrence inspired and created the Nordic Pole Walk for cancer survivor care to support the programs and services of the new MapleSoft Center in Ottawa. He has volunteered by cycling, paddling, dancing. Yes, he was a dancer with Dancing with the Stars for Easter Seals, which I think is truly brave. Uh, the Nordic Pole Walking, playing hockey, boxing for Fight for the Cure, organizing, leading, and auctioning for hundreds of charities in Canada. I have personally seen his uh, auctioneering skills. Uh, also in the Caribbean, Asia, the Far East, and Africa. Lawrence has received many awards for both his legal work and his volunteer service. And I will now pass the mic over to a man who really needs no mic, but to Lawrence Greenspawn. <laughs> Well, after that uh, uh, epic poem, I'm thinking I might have to resort to Dancing with the Stars in order to, <laughs> to uh, measure up. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. It's uh, uh, actually uh, quite a wonderful thing you've done here, uh, Adam, wherever, wherever you are. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, I, don't, I didn't anticipate seeing the presentation of these four cases in this way, and it's, uh, I'm sure, been a treat for all of us. The Operation 1985, the Operation Dismantle case, established the rule of law in the post-charter world. The Supreme Court of Canada was called upon to review the Cabinet decision to test the TURCOM guidance si uh, delivery system for cruise missiles. The request to the Canadian government uh, came from the United States, and the Cabinet of the then Liberal government of Mr. Trudeau Sr. Uh, decided to carry out these tests over northern Alberta and what was then the Northwest Territories. I want to tell you who challenged the federal cabinet decision, on what basis, uh, how the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on justiciability, and as a result of that ruling, why Operation Dismantle is the most important charter case to date. If we have time, I will uh, relate the Operation Dismantle case to Mr. Trump's executive orders and uh, his education that could have uh, taken place had he simply read the Operation Dismantle case. The WHO, uh, Operation Dismantle, which was an anti-nuclear group, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, Ontario Federation of Labour, the National Action Committee on Status of Women, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and 15 other anti-nuclear and peace groups, and my personal favourite, the Union of Spiritual Communities of Christ Community Committee for World Disarmament and Peace. I don't know how anyone could disagree with them, let alone remember their name. The responding parties named Her Majesty the Queen, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, the Attorney General of Canada, Secretary of State for External Affairs, and the Minister of Defence. The action was started with a statement of claim which essentially contained the allegation that the testing of the unarmed cruise missile would result in Canada moving up the list of nuclear targeted countries and result in a violation of Section 7 rights of all Canadians. Uh, including the one and a half million people that were members of the various plaintiff organizations. The federal government argued that the decision to test was a matter of national security and an executive decision. Does that sound familiar? Um, that it was a cabinet decision, a matter of national defense, and that it was a political question. Uh, that it was the exercise of the royal prerogative and therefore for any one of all those reasons uh, was not to be adjudicated by the courts. In effect, uh, they, that this decision was not justiciable. The government was putting forward the argument that they were above the new law, the, Char the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In an attempt to quash the action, the respondents brought a motion to strike the statement of claim, which, much to their amazement, was unsuccessful. While they were successful on appeal, the judges of the Federal Court of Appeal wrote five 
separate opinions. The matter went before a panel of three judges, including the Chief Justice Laskin, and in those days uh, one argued orally for leave to appeal. And while it turned out to be the Chief Justice Laskin's last day on the bench, he nearly cited counsel for Operation Dismantle for contempt, and then called on counsel for the federal government, who was one Ian Binney, as he then was, to explain how this was not a case of national importance. Leave to appeal was granted, and the case went before the full bench. All of these stages of hearings took place in a little over one year, given the imminence of the testing. Subsequently, Minister of Justice uh, Erwin Kotlu argued the case at Federal Court of Appeal. The late, great Gordon Henderson argued for Operation Dismantle and the coalition at the Supreme Court of Canada full hearing. And while the court ruled that the statement of claim did not disclose facts which would prove that the testing would result in an actual violation of Section 7 rights, the heart of the decision and the principle it established is in the court's ruling on justiciability. The court ruled that cabinet decisions are reviewable by the courts under Section 321A of the Charter and that the executive branch of the Canadian government bears a duty to act in accordance with the Charter and not in violation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Madam Justice Wilson specifically found that even though the decision to test was an exercise of royal prerogative, it was reviewable by the courts. There was no immunity for the federal government or cabinet by virtue of the issue being called a political question. The court had a new and fresh constitution, uh, constitutional obligation to decide whether any part particular act of the executive violated or threatened to violate any right of the citizens of this country. Can you imagine if they had said otherwise? Three things would follow necessarily from a decision which accepted the government's argument of the day. First, the government and our cabinet would essentially be above and beyond the highest law in our country, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Secondly, there would be no need for government to opt out of a charter ap uh, application. They could just circumvent it. And three, they could decide to circumvent the charter on any matter as long as they deemed it a matter of national security, a matter of defense, a political question, or a matter that came under the royal prerogative. In effect, where the government sought to avoid charter scrutiny, all they'd need to do is do by executive action that which they could not do by legislation. Operation Dismantle has been cited in over 1,100 cases in all levels of court in every province in the country. It's been featured in dozens of legal articles printed in the Supreme Court Law Review, Osgoode Hall Law Journal, Queen's Law Journal, Advocate Society Journal, McGill, Ottawa Law Review, the University of BC Law Review, Dalhousie, and so on. Robert Kennedy once said, we know it is law which enables people to live together, that creates order out of chaos. We know that law is the glue that holds civilization together. And we know that if one person's rights are denied, then the rights of all are endangered. With Operation Dismantle, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that where one person's rights are denied, the government action that caused that violation can be challenged before our courts. Thank goodness for Operation Dismantle. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, Lawrence. That was great. Um, I think Mr. Trump probably hasn't got anything on this because he can't write um, or read really more than <laughs> 140 characters, and I don't believe there's probably a brief on that in the uh, that format yet. Um, how many of you in the audience are studying to be lawyers? It's not a test, guys. You put your hands up. You're not going. How many are lawyers? Great. You know, it's kind of interesting because I was, as I was listening to you all speak, I was thinking that um, there are very few professions where in about a uh, 40 minute time frame you're going to hear uh, people laugh and 
cry and speak passionately about something uh, that they live daily in their profession. And for instance, I don't, I've never emceed an event where doctors were talking about their favorite disease or engineers about their favorite bridges. So you, uh, this is a, a, it's a wonderful profession and your presentations have been stellar. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedules to actually do this. And, um, it's now time for the audience to choose a winner. So how this is going to work is that I'm going to invite Professor Adam Dodek back to the stage, and or such as it is, and um, you will help me with the voting, as I understand it, or help all of us with the voting. So, so we hold up our hands. Vote for. <laughs> yeah. and That's right. Yeah. Yeah. If you'd like an A. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna be so fine. So, you go to Kahoot. This is the um, this is the pin. Is that right, Professor? That yep. they have to go put to in. Kahoot.it. And then your choices are Cinchcomb, Operation Dismantle, Carter versus Canada, RV Noor. And oh, here we go. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to get an A? Which is the most important charter king? Oh, the... <laughs> what was the pin? <laughs> Sorry, I'll go back. Okay, I'll write it down. Sorry, I screwed that up. <laughs> okay. Don't worry, it's, it's very... Um, <laughs> It just pumps us up a little bit more because now we're... It was much easier at home. <laughs> it always is. Okay. So here, is everyone on Kahoot? You just need the pin? Okay, here we go. Six, four, six, nine, eight, one, two. I've written it down. Six, four, six, nine, eight, one, two. Six, four, six, nine, eight, one, two. If you don't have it, put your hand up because we won't move forward. Has everyone got it? If you don't, I have it for you. But I, do you just make your own nickname? I would use a nickname since apparently some of your grades are going to be uh, depending on this. Nice. And these lovely contestants can't vote for themselves, can they? Sure. No? <laughs> okay. I think Greenspawn's got right. four cell phones there. <laughs> now, are we gonna? There we go. Now, are you ready? Yes. yes. Yes, you are. Which is the most important charter case, ladies and gentlemen, for an A in your course? Is it Carter versus Canada, RV Moore, Operation Dismantle, or RV Stinchcomb? Good job. Look at all you smart people voting away there. Good job. Well done. You're going to make fine professionals, those of you that aren't already professionals. <laughs> That's okay. It's difficult. <laughs> no, I think we're... Oh, and we're on a countdown. <laughs> you have 22 seconds left. Those of you, oh, are we good? No. Oh, oh, we're gonna need a tiebreaker. Oh my! Wow! I think okay. this might be another thing that the professor didn't consider at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to speak about your second favorite case, right? <laughs> Slam poetry. Here we well, go. should we just have a dual winner? I should we be egalitarian and we'll have a dual winner? Okay. So the two winners are Carter versus Canada and RV Noor. Am I right? Is it color coded? Congratulations. Well done. Well done. That's excellent. Can we see Katie's boots? That'll be the tiebreaker. <laughs> well, thank you very much, all of you. That was a lot of fun for me, and I hope it was for you too. Okay. Please join me in thanking our, our four contestants and Catherine Clark.
I want to uh, just recognize our conference partners and sponsors, our partner, the Department of Justice, uh, the Ottawa Law Review, the university, the faculty, the Social Science and Humanities Resource uh, Research Council, the Greenberg Chair for Women in the Legal Profession, and uh, the Canadian Mosaic Project. And thank you to all of you for coming out this afternoon, this evening. And we hope to see most of you over the next two days at the Shaw Center, uh, where our conference will be. So thank you. Again, thank you to Catherine. And thank you to Eugene, Lawrence, Anne, and Katie for a wonderful afternoon slash evening. Thank you.